I go to the schools and I go to the community and I talk about Mishnabe history. And I talk about it from what I learned growing up here in this community over the years. Um, and I learned from my own, my own people. And when I, go, when I go to the schools or talk in front of people, like uh, last fall, I went. To, I had to go down to Toronto and explain our history to our church group. And I remember saying, and I always start with this, I said, whatever I'm going to tell you, you will not find in your history textbook because all of it is oral knowledge. All of it's, you will not find these things written in, the, in your textbooks. And then when I go to the schools here, I always, I feel it's important that we learn our history our way, not from our textbooks. Although we've had a few, uh, in recent years, a few writers, one of our own people from this community has written a history on Asikanak himself. Mm. Now, I haven't finished reading the book yet, but uh, I, I do have it. <clears throat> but that's what's lacking, I think, or what should be encouraged is to learn our own history our way um, we just lost a, a member of our community who was very good at our Nishabe history. He was able to talk about names. He was able to talk about where people came from, how we got to this, how we got to this island, Nidominis, how we got to this island, Nidominis, <coughs> how our people got here, where they came from. And he was able to talk about the names of these people and where they originated from and what they actually mean. <coughs> and... Uh, just my way of thinking. I think it's important for young people to know their own history, uh, their, uh, what even even what their names actually mean. Um, to some of these, <coughs> because I also do a lot of work with our genealogy, and I've come across some of these names, and they're such beautiful sounding names. Ms. Nesink Shkode, that name's died out, and you don't see it after 1920. Mm -hmm. And kids could just understand, the young people could just understand what their name actually mean. Like uh, <clears throat> um, a lot of the common names around here. And uh, sometimes I'll explain to kids. And another thing that I guess it's my pet peeve is our names are so anglicized and they've been changed over the years and, and you've lost the uh, actual pronunciation. But if you do the actual pronunciation, <clears throat> like my original family name, my original family name is not George, mm -hmm. it's Wawiye Gishik. And Wawiye Gishik means the center, a circle. And Gishik is the sky or the day. So it's a, my original family name portrays a circular day and how things, and my guess is my, one of my great great grand, grandfathers had that name. <clears throat> and when he was Christianized, baptized, they gave him, that became his surname and whatever Christian name they gave him. So names like that, and it, and if you, <clears throat> in English you would say Wawi 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 Gijik, but in our original language, the original pronunciation, you'd say Wawi Yagijik, and then I can understand that. And uh, just to go back a little bit, my first language is Nishnabe. Uh, my neither my parents spoke English. They couldn't read or write. They never went to school, and uh, so my first exposure to English was in grade one, and uh, I had to learn it very quickly. And uh, so I I did manage to master the English language, which got me in the education system, the system quite far. But my first language has always been Nishnabe. That's the first way I learned to speak. <laughs> and um, so, and I've been told by some people, elder, more elderly than me, that I speak an old dialect, which, and uh, uh, and to this day, I still don't even know which dialect I'm speaking because I'm of a Dawa background. There's Bodeadami in my background. There's Ojibwe's in my background. So maybe I speak a combination of all three. <clears throat> and but it, nevertheless, it is still my first language. When I went to school, I spoke English because I had to. And my buddies that I went to school with, their parents taught them a little bit of English. So I was, they taught me a little bit of English, how to respond to the teacher kind of thing. But, uh, but once I got back home, it's back to Nishnabe again.
and for at least six hours a day, I had to learn English. So that's that's kind of my my personal background a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, in a way, I guess now that I look back on it, I was very fortunate to grow up that way, mm -hmm. because uh, I, because I learned history, I learned, and <clears throat> I grew up an only child, and uh, so I, and my father passed away when I was five, and my mother, <clears throat> she raised me for the rest of. Uh, until I became an adult, but she used to make sure I knew all my relatives, and by doing that, we did a lot of visiting, and since my mother didn't have uh, six or seven children behind her to tag along, I was the only kid, and so it made it easier for visiting with us, because I she'd go visit her cousins, her her elders, and and as a as a, being a little boy, and being around these old people all the time, I kind of picked up little bits and pieces here and there, mm -hmm. and I learned history that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also, my mother was lost her parents when she was a child as well. So did my father. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, they were raised by their grandparents, so they picked up that history. And sometimes, um, I think I was ten years old when we finally got electricity in the house. But I remember my mother would sit at her at her table doing bark work, uh, crafts and stuff, mm -hmm. the light of an old kerosene lamp, and she'd tell these stories. And, mm -hmm. and for a, I'm actually very surprised for someone being as young as I was back then, how some of these stories still I remember them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older and we finally did get electricity, uh, uh, TV wasn't a priority. It was, okay, because we told her about this newfangled gadget, you just turn the knob and it'll cook your food for you. And uh, of course, the fridge. So those were her first priorities, and and I used to go to my uh, neighbor sometimes and watch TV, and I bugged my mother to get us a TV. But then afterwards, she started noticing. Well, she would say, "Atebdona, ke woka kwedabatmaton." Turn that off. I'm going to tell you something, and she started going on. And so I learned history that way, and I think it's important. I think I'm. I think I'm the kind of person I am now because I learned all my history. I learned the history of my own relatives. I learned where they came from. And uh, with this genealogy work, it kind of backs up what I was told orally. I said, mm -hmm. oh, this is where he came from. I'll go back to my great-great-great-grandfather. He said, oh, my mom did, was right. She knew all that history. And just going here through the genealogy records, mm -hmm. I said, oh, that backs up the story, that backs it up, and there's written proof somewhere. Yes. <clears throat> and going through old census records, you find that information too. And so everything that I learned growing up, I kind of say, hey, this, it is, it's not just hearsay. I, there's actually some paper proof that where these people came from. So the oral knowledge that I, that I do gather Sometimes I come across a little tidbit of information. I say, oh, this did actually happen. This is what happened. And you, you see it in written form, and, and it's just not an oral story. We do have some young people who are very eager and want to learn, eh? But we ca I can't do it in a, in a setting like this in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so a few times... <clears throat> Like uh, on uh, on June twenty first again, I'll be talking about Nishnabi history, but I'm showing all the things that I do, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. so like Nibi uh, Shabu King mm -hmm. making fire, making tea over an open fire. You got to show. It's just my own perspective, but Naha Nishke, and I tell this story. Nishke, Shkodes Manda, Shkodes, on Piga we Oskadan, Nishnabi Chikustoi Na Psakodenjan. And it's a way of uh, trying to teach the language that they actually see what I'm doing. And, uh, and to promote the language, I think that's what we need to do because that is one of the things that I'm really into and really quite passionate about is trying to teach our, the young people our language. And at the same time, I could tell the history at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I do language stuff, that's what, it's, it's visual. And uh, um, 
a couple of years ago, they had me go on the community moose hunt. And the, the fellow who wanted me to come along, he says, at the same time, you could teach Nishnabe and while you're out there. And they did the same thing as they videotaped me. And there was one morning, a young man came in, he's all excited. Oh, we shot a moose, we shot a moose. And of course, they said, oh, Stephen, you're coming along because you're going to explain what we're doing in the language with the moose. And I said, I haven't gutted an animal in a long, long time. I think I was a teenager last time I went hunting. Mm -hmm. And I said, the biggest animal I ever gutted was a deer. But mm -hmm. I figured, well, the same principle, just a bigger animal, that's all. Mm -hmm. So when we got to the, where this uh, animal was uh, shot, they handed me a knife. He says, okay, explain what you're doing. And then I said, oh, I'm going to go to the house. And then I'm explaining what I'm doing with the knife and peeling back this, the hide of the, the skin of the animal. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you get into the other stuff where you uh, And then I was going after the liver. That's a really good part of the moose. Mm -hmm. And so I went after the liver, and he was still warm. And, and I'd say, Yeah, we're going to have a good time. 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 We're going to And I named off the animal, the parts of this animal in Nishnabe. Mm -hmm. And then I said, Nashkewit Konafju Watani. And then I reached down, took my little knife, and I cut out the liver, and I and I held like this in front of the camera. Nashkemanda Watani gana jun kod. And then I went on to describe the the kod, the liver. And then I pointed to different parts of the animal that Nashkemanda de Manda Dod Koswaya and I was pointing to the different parts of the animal, what they're called. And then came to the part where I was deboning because this animal was killed so far in the woods and we had to cross a swamp so an ATV couldn't make it out there. So what we had to do was uh, cut up the animal out there in the woods mm -hmm. and the young men were, were asked to get grab pack sacks and they'd haul it out by foot mm -hmm. and, uh, to the spot where the ATVs and the trucks were left. Mm -hmm. So that was a good mile trek back, back to the main trail. And again, that's all I was doing. They were videotaping me while I was doing this. And I, ha and I had to speak Nishnab all the way through, mm -hmm. which was relatively easy for me anyway. Then I'm explaining what I'm doing. And I think that's another thing. And th that moose hunt we went on, we were fortunate there were some young kids there in their teens and in their 20s. So I was kind of showing them what I was doing and explaining what I'm doing at the same time and talking about what I'm doing. And... Like, um, I remember in school back in, in, when I went to Pontiac school back then, they had something called out, outdoor education, but I didn't know what it was or haven't. And they took my, I remember they took microscopes out there to teach us outdoor education. And like, of course, I'm only a, a teenager at the time. So I can't figure out. I, I already know some of this stuff, what they're talking about. Why do we need microscopes and stuff? And again, that's what it was. But uh, I knew some of the stuff they were talking about. But because I learned it at home. And the late, uh, my, uh, the late Isaac Pitamonica always said, the place to start learning is in your home. If you're going to learn how to gut a deer, you got to know you will learn that at home. And I remember as a boy when I'd go snaring rabbits, <clears throat> again, I learned how to gut and uh, skin a rabbit, a partridge, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the actual last time I went hunting was when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And every kid had a gun. Or if I didn't have one, I might just go to the neighbor and borrow as long as I had my own, my own ammunition to use. It was no big, no big deal to him. Oh, Manda, ah, go to my neighbor and say, "What's the thing that could happen? Da you pan me beneke, or and they what was on da you pan dogma?" And go to his cousin. Oh, Manda, the cousin, week the dog. He asked me if I have bullets. Yeah, don't worry about that. And then I go. If I was fortunate enough to shoot a rabbit or a partridge, and that was okay. A deer would have been even better. <coughs> so. Uh, and again, it's just, I guess, kind of lo learning my way is just, in some in some cases, was trial and error. Because to this day, 
I, I am not a mechanic. <laughs> Yesterday I tried fixing my lawnmower and I needed help because I didn't know what I did wrong because it still wouldn't start. Mm -hmm. And my neighbor came along yesterday and he says, Oh, this is what you did wrong. He's good with engines. Yeah. Me, I'm told I'm a complete idiot when it comes to engines. Oh, amazing. <laughs> so, so he showed me how to do it and I was really watching what he was doing at the same time. Again, if you're going to um, teach something like that, and of course, he, he's older than, uh, he's one, again, one of my neighbors, and we always talk Nishnabe. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to Nishnabe while he was talking to me. Mm -hmm. And it's a good, good way to learn things. And it's a bit of a, sometimes when I do this, I have to sometimes, I jokingly call it the, the foreign language, I have to speak in a foreign language, which is English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I do that. And, and another way, I remember, I went to a, a Jagannath public school, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to explain treaties. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, those kids are going to be bored out of their mind if I'm just standing up there gabbing away. So I made them get involved. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I said, I'm the I'm the Indian agent. And I picked one of those kids. I said, you're the chief of the community, and these are your your that's your little group. I said, and I, I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to come to you and I say, I want your land. And you're going to tell me no. You're going to go like this. Ka, gain, gain. And I taught him what to say. Gain, gain. I paid up nothing on the kid. So, and then what I'm going to do is go behind your back and sneak behind the people. And I'm going to flash a little bit of Shonia. And they're going to say, okay. And I said, that's how treaties were made. And I had those kids, they were all sitting at their, their desk. And I said, okay, now you guys send the treaty. So you get that little corner of the room. I have your whole classroom now. And that's how I explained treaties because I knew they would be bored out of their minds if I just chatted. Mm. And I think they needed to see a visual representation. We want them what, we know them what, hear and see. Mm and what was being said mm -hmm. and then I moved him to the corner of the room I said okay this is your this is yours now but I have this I have your whole classroom that's how I talked about treaties Interesting. it was uh, and again it was to a non-native uh, Jagannath group of kids right. and I got them to understand treaties and especially the Manitoulin treaty which, which I'm quite familiar with and uh, again, through oral knowledge, I heard all the shenanigans that took place when they made that treaty. Yes. And so that's how I explain treaties. Mm. And I think hopefully they they know what it's about now. Yes. And how this how this land became, how their public school became Shaganash land all of a sudden. For Nishnabe education, I would like. At least in the schools, it doesn't happen because I remember when I learned history when I was growing up, I was learning about what happened in the United States, what happened in, in Canada, the Canadian Parliament, and we learned all that, the BNA Act and all that. And I, for me, I couldn't figure out why I was learning this stuff. And But as I got older and I got to listen more to my own my own people talk about my own history. It became it became fascinating, and it's been with me for a, a long number of years now. Where I, where I'll, my uncle is ninety two now, and he talks a little bit, and but he's totally different from the way my mother was. My mother was always gabbing. She was she was a talker. My uncle, he's ninety two now. He's the exact opposite. He's not much of a speaker, and I kind of have to pry stuff out of him, just keep questioning him. And he, he doesn't elaborate, he's not very good at elaborating on his answers. So I kind of have to oh, 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 pry. Yeah. And then there's other people I'll talk, and they'll go on and on, and sometimes I have to say, oh, it's almost supper time, I'm sorry, I have to go. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's a couple of weeks ago, I going to go visit some of the elders at the uh, nursing home. And at 4 o'clock, about 4.30, the cart came around bringing their supper, and I said, well, I'm not going to interrupt you during your supper. I'm going to go home and cook my own. Mm -hmm. But if you visit them at their homes, that's a totally different story again. I remember visiting an elderly couple, 
and I was at the time this is ten years ago. I was working down at the heritage office, and I was only I I borrowed a photo off them, an old old photo, and I was only going over there to return it. And I told my boss when I left the office, I said, uh, "I'll be right back. I'm only going to be gone for fifteen minutes, half an hour at the most." Mm -hmm. You know what happened when I got there? This old elderly couple. He said, and it, I just finished lunch, and so this is the afternoon. And he said, oh, Stephen, we've been together, my And I had that, that little photo. I said, oh, I've been together, been together, been together. And then, and then he says, oh, and John, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you something. And they were all happy, eh? And they were all happy, eh? They had this fresh fish, and it was already cooking. It's ready for eating. And it was just caught that morning, and they were all excited. And, and they said, oh, nobody, hardly anybody comes to visit anymore. And he says, and I made some scones, and we got fish and sit down. And I, and I didn't want to be rude and say, I mean, I did tell him I just finished lunch. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, you have to be polite and accept the, the food. So I, and I, my my 15 minute errand turned out to be way past my, way past the closing time of the office. Yes. And I remember com, coming to, uh, back to work the following morning. Where'd she go? She never came back. Well, you know what happens when you visit with elderly people. You you go there and they're happy to see you and they want to visit some more. And, you, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to speak the language. And we talked and we talked. And next thing I know, it's almost six o'clock. And they invited me for a fish lunch, mm -hmm. fresh fish. And I said, and uh, I said, that's what happened. And now I forgot what, what I was talking about now. But about I was the talking, vision, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If we can get, I know it's, I know we're kind of stuck in this, uh, what they call um, the provincial whatever curriculum, <laughs> where you have to sit in a classroom. Mm -hmm. But if they could inco incorporate some real outdoor education with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I, I understand you have to learn math and science and all these other things. But wouldn't it be more fun to learn to if you were out there in the woods? Yes. Uh, my mother, she was uh, great at gathering medicines, and she would tell me what this plant used for some of the, uh, unfortunately, some of the plants we couldn't find because they didn't grow or or whatever, but uh, it'd be, and she used to tell me, and she'd tell me what time of the year to harvest it, when to go get it, what I'm supposed to do, what I, I, I went. and she used to, she was, back then they sold plug tobacco. Um, it wasn't uh, like this uh, cigarette tobacco. It was real to plug tobacco. And uh, she would buy that at the store. You know, unfortunately, they don't sell it at the store now. And she'd buy that and lots of that. And when she'd go out gathering her medicine, she would put that tobacco down as her offering. Oh. And if kids could just see that kind of thing happen, take them out into the woods, explain to them, what this what this plant does or what it's for or its tree you know what you could use or even um uh, i knew a man he was very skilled at making oars axe handles hammer handles and there was a specific tree he want he used and it's only after he's gone now he's been gone for over 20 years now but i finally recognized the tree that he used manos because i um I had him make two axe handles for me. I tried to make him out of whatever hardwood I could, but he said, you're not using the right wood. I remember that. Man, no, cousin. But I gave him my axe heads and said, could you make these for me? But I really wanted to go out there and have him show me how to do it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, and all he did was he took my axe handles and never, never called me up and said, here, I'll show you what to do, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I really want him to do that, but uh, he brought me back, back my axe handles, all nicely made. I still, I still have them, mm -hmm. and they're still pretty solid. But he was explained to me in Nishnave how you fashion an axe handle, what kind of wood, and what you do. But it would have been a lot easier if I actually saw him do it, and you know that kind of thing. I mean, it's nice to be able to talk about how it's done, but to actually see it being done. Mm -hmm. Same the same thing with uh, tanning hides and stuff like that. Eh? 
I mean, there are people who are skilled who are, still have that skill, but you can't talk about it in in this setting. Yes. You got to actually go out there, from like that moose that uh, that was shot when I went out on the moose hunt. Mm -hmm. You got to see the process from start to finish, the actual taking off the hide of the animal, mm -hmm. and uh, and then salting it, and then doing all that. Because I got a really good friend uh, who knows how to do that but it's a year-long process mm -hmm. and it takes a long time it's not something you can do within a week there's a process to it and she showed me how to do all this mm -hmm. she's still showing me how to do all this and she was and she's very good at it mm -hmm. and uh, even the smoking stage the first smoking second smoking and all that and what you do and how you get the hair off and mm -hmm. all this other stuff and I mean, it's something that would be uh, a teenager could learn, eh? and how th this is done. But again, it's not done in one week. It's a continuous process. She, sa she says it takes about a year to get a hide ready, even for the, to make it feel like this. Time is one thing, yeah. Because there's, there's uh, even uh, I was catching a ride of a young lady today here. And she was asking me her what her original family name was. I told her the story of her family name. Mm -hmm. And even that skill, I know that skill no longer is here, but back in the day, like the, around 100 years ago, there was men who were very skilled at making square timbers, out using just using axes and adds. And I was talking about her, her great, 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 great grandfather, who was the first carrier of this name. Now, whatever his name was before that, but he became known by his skill at hewing logs out of uh, hewing square timbers out of logs, and he kept, and whatever his family original family he became known by this by how his skill he was, and then to this day some of that family still carries that name, because uh, again somehow his name got changed from what, what he was called, and then he became known for this skill, and then the family name carries on to this day. And I, and I told her the story of that, how her family name, and I said, one of your great-great-grandfathers, I don't know what his name would have been, but that's where the name originated, because he was very skilled at making log homes. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, they probably forgot about his name, his actual name, and he was... And then now the family carries on that name of what he was very skilled at. Mm -hmm. And it's just the act of hewing a log to make a square timber. Mm -hmm. And apparently this man was very skilled at it. Mm -hmm. And it's things like that, even your your own family surname, those who carry still have the Anishinaabe family surnames, go back in time, try and figure out the original meaning of the word or with our family names because they're so anglicized now. And unfortunately, uh, you have to be able to understand the Shnabe when to, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize to the kids today or young people. No, try and go back into your background. Try and find the original, the original meaning of this name. Uh, and if you can, and I know for non-speaking, those who don't, whose first language is not the Shnabe when I've been told that those who are trying to learn it, they have a so sore mouth afterwards from trying to speak it all the time because I guess you use different muscles. And there's some sounds that come from here. Some sounds are nasal. And you got to try and capture those. And then, and that's where the I think the young people are kind of stuck because they're, 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 we're taught in English and they can't get their, their vocal cords to make the same sounds as as you would in Nishnabe for a, a natural speaker of Nishnabe. Mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to say, try and learn your name, try and, try and find out what your original pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And if you could say that, like when I gave my original family name, uh, it spelled, uh, it spelled Wawa Gizik, English pronunciation. But if you go back and find the original translation, you'd say Wawa Yagizik. And again, that, that, kind of tone that you have because in Nishnabe when there's also you could say something like I could say uh, uh, 
somebody standing at the door and I could see being again in that person standing at the door and, and, I, said, and I would say and that's kind of a command and that same person would come along and stand at the door and I'd say it's kind of that's more of an invite mm -hmm. but the other way I said it again depending on my tone I'm kind of telling them, don't just stand at the door sit down Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this other way I said, ah, mean again, I'm mm, Yes. So it's, it's again trying to get people to understand there's different, I guess, tones of how you speak, mm -hmm. ways of learning language. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a young man I was talking to. He's probably in his 40s now. But I remember he was raised by his grandparents. I remember asking him one day, how come you don't speak Nishnabe? I said, your grandparents were fluent, very fluent Nishnabe speakers. And you know what he said? He says, well, they only spoke Nishnabe to me when they were mad at me. <laughs> 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 and that's the only thing he knows about Nishnabe. Yes. And from his perspective, it must be a, um, it's the only time you speak it. <laughs> But it, 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 it was kind of funny. And I said, well, I used to visit with your grandparents. They spoke real good in mm -hmm. And they didn't sound mean to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I guess that's the only time you heard it was, I'm Mesemek Kayan. Or, uh, yes. You know, being a pest inside the house. Yes. And so I guess that's the only memory he has of Nishnabe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, whoever you're teaching English or in Nishnabe, yeah. it's always good to see a we um, to see have a visual we know the man and uh, to see and hear um, like um, I went to MSS and um, and I learned some of my carpentry skills from there. And I still remember some of them because it was shown me. I, they showed me the board going through the the uh, the uh, table saw, mm -hmm. and some of that skills I picked up. But I also picked up some of, some of the other skills that I learned from an old man who's a really great carpenter, mm -hmm. and he was very skilled at that. And and uh, he taught me many things. So I learned from both the high school the high school system where I learned and. Uh, and then there was this old man that, that uh, I kind of uh, looked up to for his knowledge of history again mm -hmm. and for his skill as a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And so, um, although I'm not, a, I'm not a carpenter by trade, that's not my occupation anymore, but I, when I do dabble in carpentry, those are the things I remember. And he actually physically showed me how to use it, what kind of wood and what kind of... And, so I was getting uh, education for, from the high school in MSS and from what this old man taught me, mm -hmm. how, to, how to treat wood and how to take care of it and how to use it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could, you could learn from both sides. It's just that, that part about the physical actually, I guess what they call the hands-on approach. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can read all about it in, in the books. And when I talk about history, I'll... I'll, I'll point to this building here. Mm -hmm. I say, and if I have to speak English, well, I have to. And then I'll talk about this stone was quarried from out there, and I'll point out there to where I, um, where's that, what's the island, the quarry, Haywood Island, Haywood I think. Island, yeah. Yes. I say, uh, they got rocks from Haywood Island, they put them on stone, uh, stone rafts, rafts, and they, and they brought them up here and they quarried that stone from there and that's how they, these buildings were built. Mm -hmm. If I have to speak English, I do that. Mm -hmm. And so they, and if, and unfortunately sometimes I'm in the classrooms, but I'll have a picture of it mm -hmm. or even a picture of these ruins. Yeah. Said, this is how these build, things were built. These how, this is where the stone was quarried from. And if it's easier if I have them standing in front of the church in these ruins to be able to tell the story. And I could point, we're still at Haywood Island. Mm -hmm. At Haywood Island, they put these 
stones on a raft and then kind of show and they carried them up the hill and mm -hmm. built the stone and, you know that kind of thing even to to describe history and I'll describe where the original village was in the 1600s mm -hmm. uh, and I'll point to that bay and I have a rough idea of where the original village was back in the 1600s and I could point to there and I say to him Back then, that was a major river. Now it's just a tiny little stream, but 1600 and something, it was an actual river. And the only reason I know that is because there was a Jesuit here that came up here in 1648 and spent a year here. Again, from I've been looking for his diary or his journal for years now. Wherever he wrote one or it got destroyed, I don't know. But then, <clears throat> uh, again, oral history kind of says, the older people that I remember growing up with, the people that are long gone now, how they described the village. And it wasn't until about 30 years ago I actually found out, well, Father Antoine Ponce spent 1648 in Wiki, in the, um, in the community of Wikwemkwem. Back then it wasn't called Wikwemkwem. I, I don't know what this originally. And then I remember old Shimnamput, an old man, he was a chief here in the 40s, but they used to bring him to the school. And that's another thing I enjoyed about being at Pontiac School. They used to bring in elders to talk about history. Mm -hmm. And back then, most of his kids understood Nishnabe when anyway, so he'd talk in Nishnabe. Mm -hmm. And I still remember his stories. I remember uh, Philip Vitonko talking about the great fire, the fi fire that destroyed this whole island. He talked about that. Mm -hmm. And um, Shimnan got his stories of the village, and then he talked about Ostodigitewa, and then he would talk about where the original village was. Mm -hmm. And he talked about that. And again, this is all from his own memory. He was in his 80s by this time. And it's stuff that he kept in his mind from his parents or grandparents or wherever he heard these stories from. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the late Philip He, mm -hmm. Again, it's all knowledge that he retained as a boy growing up and how he, how he held on to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it's, it's a great way to learn if you could, and that's what I liked about Pontiac School is at least once a month they used to bring in an elder to talk, to visit with us, mm -hmm. and he'd talk, and, and unfortunately in the school system, you're allowed one hour or whatever, the same thing with Nishnabe when you're allowed it only 20 minutes or half an hour to teach Nishnabe mm -hmm. but you got to have the full experience, I think, you got to experience the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Experience going out to a camp, setting up camp. The poles he used. And just even just that stuff, just basic stuff that you do at a camp. You know, and I know uh, every year they they. Can the high school kids, there's a teacher up the hill who takes the kids on a canoe ride. I think 10 days, and I think they started the French River. And the late Isaac, he passed away a little over a month ago now. And he was, uh, and he, he used to, at first, the first one he went on, he actually canoed the, from the, the French River area to here. And he says, and then I kind of laughed and he says, because he was sorry he hadn't done that in like 60 years or so <laughs> the last time he paddled a canoe or paddled a boat and so the following year they had him wherever these kids stop he was there because they take him by boat and he'd go tell history mm. and again he was in the middle of the forest and so he'd be able to talk about plants too and show trees and all this other stuff and again, unfortunately, he had to speak in a foreign language too, there too, because he, the kids didn't understand the Shnabe Yes. But that's a great way to tell, talk about history visually. Mm. I could show them the buildings. You could show, oh, me and Piva dot so and so. Mm -hmm. This is where so and so lives. He's the first one to have a store mm -hmm. in this community. Yes. Visual aids, even old photographs. I love collecting old photographs. Mm -hmm. And again, that's another. You show kids. This is what Wikwemkong used to look like back around uh, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they see the dirt roads going across and you, all the log homes that were here at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember uh, 
There is one picture. Yeah, it is an actual photo I saw, and I'd like to get my hands on it. It's a picture of where what's today called we went from way and Cabernet Road meet. Mm -hmm. There's a photo from around the turn of the century, around the 1920s. And all there is is a dirt road, little uh, wagon trail for the horses. Mm -hmm. And it's in underneath the picture it says, where Cabernet Road meets we come from. Today you'd have to explain that to the kids. It's, this is where these two roads meet. And there's a really great photograph of the, of the community uh, with that photo. Nice. And it, it shows up from that end looking up the hill towards the, towards the church. Mm -hmm. And that would be really, uh, I think, really something for kids to see mm -hmm. how much this community has changed.